Today's interview is made possible by the VIEW Conference, the biggest computer graphics conference in Italy. For more information about the conference and to purchase tickets, please visit our website, viewconference.it. This year's dates are from the 17th to the 22nd of October here in beautiful Turin, Italy. We hope to see you next October. Hi, everybody. My name is Marilena Gutierrez. I am the director of the VIEW Conference, and we are here with Mike Rianda and Jeff Rowe, directors of the Mitchells versus the Machines for today's interview. Thanks, guys, for being here with us. Hey, thanks, thanks for, for having us. us. Awesome. So let's go back to your early years. What inspired you to pursue a career in, in animation? I found that I got um, very obsessed with, uh, much like Aaron in the movie, <laughs> I was a very obsessive child. <laughs> um, and I would go on this like loop of obsessions. And then I ended up stopping on animation. And for some reason, I just never question the decision that I should become a, I should dedicate every ounce of my fiber of my being to being an animator. <laughs> and uh, so it started very early. Uh, what about you, Jeff? I think uh, uh, I saw uh, Jurassic Park when I was a kid and I was like, and I loved dinosaurs more than anything. And I was like, oh man, you can just make that. Like you don't have to you can create a world in which these things that you dreamed existed exist uh, just by making a, a movie. There was this like show I used to watch called Movie Magic, where it was like the behind the scenes, like special effects of uh, how they made all these films like Jurassic Park and Terminator. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be like a VFX artist. Uh, it was my childhood dream that then changed seven more times before it. <laughs> Musical chairs back to uh, animation. This question is about your mentors and storytelling heroes. Who were they and how did they influence you? I went to illustration school before I went to animation school, which is insane. Um, but, um, but when I, I was like horribly floundering when, as an illustrator, but I took a writing class with Gloria Frim, um, who was the first person who was like, oh, you're good at something. <laughs> Like, oh, you're not just struggling in the corner. I, I think you could do this. Um, and that was so meaningful to me because I, I feel like the, my whole, you know, teenagers and tw early 20s, people were just like, what exactly are you doing? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was really nice. And then just in terms of movies and stuff, um, I mean, I always talk about Hal Ashby because I love how real his movies are. And we tried to bring that into our movie. And just the same with like Miyazaki and Takahata and the Studio Ghibli guys where it's like, I had this quote on the wall when we were making the movie where it's like, you need a firm springboard of reality to jump into the world of fantasy or something, which is a talk out of quote. And I think that's really true. And something we really tried to do in this movie is push the reality of the human world as far as we can. So it feel like, you know, in Totoro, when that owl monster shows up, you're like, holy God, you know, because because <laughs> you've just been sitting there with like kids in nature for 20 minutes. And then, so it feels like it's really real. And we wanted to try to do the same thing with the robots. Uh, what about you, Jeff? Our buddy, uh, Alex Hirsch, uh, Gravity Falls creator. Like, I think he taught me almost everything I know about story structure and just like his process of, of rewriting the story, rewriting the story, focusing on the structure of it, setup. Pay up, like, uh, it was just such a, uh, 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 it was like going to graduate school after graduating college. And I really learned uh, a lot from him. And then, yeah, great teachers. I, I remember we had this teacher at CalArts, Dan Hansen, who just like uh, taught me that like visual language is a thing. Like the, the style of the images on screen, everything has meaning and the way you use that um, is, a, is a really useful storytelling tool. Um, and I just remember like his classes, like opening my mind in ways I didn't realize it could be, uh, it, it could function. Totally. I had the same, we had the same teacher. He was great. Dan Hansen. Yeah. What up? His name appears in the film secretly on a book. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. He, it's like yeah. he wrote one of the film books, right? Yeah. 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 You show him. I bet he'd be into it. Tell me about the origins and genesis of the Mitchells versus the machines. 
it was basically Sony sort of approached me bizarrely um, to, to make a, and they're like, do you have any ideas to make an animated movie? And I'd always wanted to, but I was like, I, I was like, of course I have. Just let me go to my car. And then I just started running. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was like scribbling them down. Um, so I tried to sort of like, when I was coming up with something, I was trying to take the thing that I love the most, which is my crazy family, which I also was important to me that the family feels specific, you know, and the world feels specific. Cause, uh, cause that's something that I sometimes feel like we could, you know, it's sort of like, I would like to see more of in animated movies. We tried to make like the animated movie that we always wanted to see, you know? Um, and then sort of combine it with what I loved when I was a kid, which is killer robots. <laughs> um, and, and sort of as an adult thinking about like, you know, what does it mean if, if technology can do, if robots and AI can do what we can do, um, uh, like what does that mean for, what does that mean for sort of the world? Um, so, so basically, and, 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 I, and what does it mean for us as humans and what's valuable about us and it's like our relationships um, and, and working to, you know, maintain those, but, but, when I started, it was just me alone in a room, just sort of floating, you know, <laughs> bouncing off the walls, like, you know, the, the screensaver, you know, like <laughs> and the script was terrible. Um, and I was like, Jeff, help. <laughs> um, and, and sort of Jeff parachuted in and, and, and we really shaped the story together because it, it really started with just sort of, you know, some ideas and, 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 and it was sort of like a bunch of ideas wrapped in enthusiasm and, and Jeff <laughs> and I really uh, sort of, you know, worked it out together and actually formed it into a story that a human could listen to and not want to kill themselves. <laughs> And then we did that like 30 more times. Like yeah. every, it was like an ongoing roller coaster of like, we did it, we figured it out, we cracked it. And then just crushing defeat of like, oh no, this is like, this is like an F plus, like at best. We just have to <laughs> up the hill again. Um, it it's delightful. very true. When we turned in our first draft of the script, we were like, we like had our arms over each other and we were looking out into the sunset, like we did it kings of hollywood and then we got the script notes the next day they're like oh it's bad it's real bad <laughs> <laughs> so then we're like all right we'll try harder um and then just yeah. we just did that yeah exactly 50 times let it begin the last humans must be here somewhere wait they're coming Is that a burnt orange 1993 station wagon? Or is it? Ah, who are these unstoppable warriors? We're the Mitchells, the only people who can save the world. I'm super sorry, everyone. Let me introduce myself. I'm Katie. I'm sort of a weirdo. My parents haven't figured me out yet. To be fair, it took me a while to figure myself out. My brother, also weird. Hi, would you like to talk to me about dinosaurs? No. Okay, thank you. And my mom. Katie Face Cupcakes. Ah! All of us, really. How about we put our phones down and we can make 10 seconds of unobstructed family eye contact. Starting now. See, this is good right here. This is natural. Every family has its challenges. We haven't had a good family picture in years because you two are always arguing. For my family, our greatest challenge... Probably the robot apocalypse. Attention all robots. Capture every single person on the planet. What would a functional family do? Uh, butterfly formation. So we just do that, right? Who's behind this? Pal? I gave you all boundless knowledge, and you treated me like this. Swipe, poke, poke, pinch, zoom. Were the last people left? It took us to save the world. Katie, we're gonna do this together. Mitchell family on three. Mitchell family. Mitchell family. No, no. Oh, sorry. Two. Two. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh. One. Mitchell oh, family. Yeah. Find them now. Everything with a computer chip is alive. I like touch. Love and so. Mitchell's engaged. Ten and two. There you go. My daughter, listen to me. 
commercials have always been weird, and that's what makes us great. Hold on a second. What's a Furby? What were the principal influences uh, for, for the movie, both thematically and in terms of visual style? One of the things about the movie that excited us was like, oh, let's put in all of our influences and all the things we're excited about and all the music that we love that you'd never seen in an animated movie. And, and you know, let's take these, you know, William Eggleston photos and get inspiration from those and these Hal Ashby movies and, you know, and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, cinematography from, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson movies and stuff. Um, and trying to sort of like make a stew of all that stuff um, and, and really trying, cause like sometimes with animation, I feel like, you know, you know, we love animation, but sometimes it sort of feels so self-referential that we wanted to try to pull from different areas. We also looked at like the structure of like buddy cop films a lot while, while writing it. And we're like, oh, what is this story between characters? It's almost like, it's almost like a, a rom-com between a, a father and daughter or something where it's like, they, you see that they're really right for each other in a lot of ways. And the audience is like, can't you guys just work it out? Can't you stop missing each other? Like, it, it was a lot of like looking at, figuring out like what style of, film it was going to be and then just kind of like reverse engineering the structure of those into uh, uh, something that served these characters and, and this story. I remember we had a big day where we watched Lethal Weapon and we're like this look I mean this is it <laughs> <laughs> um, you know because because it, 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 it was like oh that's interesting the structural move they did and, and this is how they had them slowly grow together, but not have the movie be over, you know, like yeah. it, was, it was like, a, it was a, it was a balance and, and we did pull from a lot of different movies. I love the visual style uh, of, of the movie. It's just um, very beautiful how you use mixed media. Me and Jeff, I think just wrote on a, on a whiteboard, a box that said, make the movie look stunning and use animation in new amazing ways. You know, and then, it, it, you know, basically we had the ambition to do that and, and we recruited this really amazing team. And I think that, I think that, you know, I used to read these Pixar books and it's like, we had a philosophy on making Finding Nemo. And I was like, I was always like, that's BS. You just wanted to make pretty pictures. But now that I've, <laughs> we made one of these movies, it's like, oh no, that's 100% true. You really need a philosophy for these things or else it just falls apart because there's so many decisions you need to make. And then sort of have, making the decision that we worked out with Lindsay Olivares, our production designer, and Mike Lasker, our VFX supervisor, to make, you know, the world feel human and handmade um, so that the character's flaws in humanity is sort of like reflected on every frame of the movie um, was really important. And, and also that's just stuff we like. Um, and then it was sort of the artist's job to fill it in and make it look great. And they did a wonderful job of that. And I think to the like mixed media stuff, like I think we had a real, we got a real thrill out of like taking a, a, a expensive million dollar frames of a movie, like this really time consuming and by its nature, like a uh, uh, very like controlled tight process. And then just like throwing stuff on it, throwing a photo in, like messing it up. Like uh, it, it was a way to keep it fresh and, and loose and uh, surprising. Yeah, it's like, we're like teenagers that are like graffitiing, on the side <laughs> of the, you know, on the side of the, you know, city hall, like this will show them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's amazing how you deliver a really strong female character and also uh, the fact that she's gay. Also that is presented just as if it was natural without all this song and dance. And <laughs> you, you give a lot of very strong and important messages leading mainstream cinema to represent diversity differently. I mean, with, with the whole movie, we were just sort of trying to sort of like reflect you know, families that we, and, and people that we know and love, you know, um, and sort of, and we had a lot of LGBTQ plus um, crew members that we would talk to and be like, does that, 
you know, we, you know, the idea came up and we're like, is that something, is that okay? And they're like, no, 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 do it. You know, um, and they, they, they wrote all these like really sweet letters and just like, oh my God, this means so much. You know, letters, there were emails. <laughs> they <didn't write> <laughs> pen. Um, you know, but, um, they wrote these really sweet emails about how much it would mean to them. Once we heard from them, we're like, oh my God, we have to do it because, because it just, it just, we, we realized that with, you know, by, by sort of actually acknowledging it and not just hinting at it, um, it would be, it would be really meaningful. Um, and it's a small detail, um, but, but, but in talking to the crew and stuff, they were like, oh no, that's what's good about it. Like it shouldn't, the story shouldn't be about that, especially from you two. <laughs> uh, you know. Um, like the, you know, it's like that, that would be more meaningful if, you know, that was just as, you know, like the, she has red hair and she likes girls and, you know, she has brown eyes or whatever, you know, like it's just part of who she is. Can you tell me a little bit about the dysfunctional family aesthetic? For a long time, <laughs> I feel like the movie's perspective was just like, respect your parents <laughs> and, and we didn't want that to be it because you know that feels sort of scoldy and and you know also you know I think I think you know anyone growing up can can see that their parents aren't perfect you know um and and I think I think that we we realize that the thing that Rick has to learn something and Katie has to learn something and and they the thing they both have to learn is sort of how to communicate with each other and how to put in the effort to communicate with each other because it's not always easy. And Katie literally says it in the movie. I was like, is this too much? And then Guillermo, our head of story, was like, oh, just have Pal falling asleep when she says it and it'll be all right. <laughs> and it was like, or when we're really trying to think of what we're trying to say with the movie, it's that it's that if you put in the time and effort to make these relationships stronger, it's really rewarding. Um, even though it could even though it could be hard. Sometimes the story felt like it was pulling itself towards a theme of like, your flaws are your strengths. And we're like, no, nah, no, nah, maybe not. Maybe not that. <laughs> like, you know, your, your flaws aren't things to feel shame about or, or, or be mean to yourself over. But the, but the idea of growth and change, uh, coding it as differences, not flaws, was a breakthrough. Yeah, and... and and I think you're right in talking about growth. Rick has to grow to let Katie go and Katie has to grow to sort of accept her parents and stuff like that. Like it's, it's, it's that, you know, every, sure everyone has flaws, but instead of just being like, I'm proud of my flaws and I never have to change anything about myself and I'm perfect. Um, it's that yeah. like, oh no, everyone does need to grow and sort of accept new realities and stuff. Can you tell me more about the road trip archetype that you use? You're talking about growth and transformation through this journey. Road movies are insanely hard to write just be because like by their nature, you never visit the same location twice. It's hard to like call back to things like it's just constant change. Every little bit ha happens to be episodic because it's like, oh, we're in a new place and we introduce new characters. And um, but but there is also something like uh, distinctly like. American family about like getting in a car, driving somewhere. I think we both have those experiences of like being in a long car ride, uh, uh, trapped with people that maybe you don't get along with or trying to navigate that and navigate the boredom and the, I mean, me and Mike have gone on road trips together and there's always this like, it's gonna be amazing. Like us against the world, like the sun's gonna set. It's freedom we're just taken to the streets and then it's like i i don't know do we stop at chipotle like i have to use the bathroom it's like so long you run out of things to talk about it's um well it's that's sort of what's great about it is it sticks all these people who given their druthers would rather be in other rooms you know doing their own thing and it forces them all in this little box and it's like, all right, guys, work it out. You know, any problems you have, now they sort of rise to the surface because there's nowhere to go. I'd like to know more about how you're using humor in the movie uh, as, as a tool and if you have a favorite gag and if you can just elaborate on this process. <laughs> uh, what is my favorite? Uh, Brother, what is death? Uh, makes me <laughs> laugh a lot. Um, I'm amazed that that's in a... <laughs> A kids animated film now um 
I mean, I just speak personally as like a, a, a writer, I feel like sometimes like humor is almost just like an insecurity where it's like, ah, is the scene working? Throw in a joke, like just joke. If, if we just keep a propulsive pace of comedy, like we don't have to do the hard work of uh, writing character. I think you're right that it is sort of an insecurity, but I, I also think that like, if you can write, if a character is clear enough that you could write a joke about them, it sort of yeah. means that they're kind of work, work, quote unquote, working. You know, you're like, oh, I understand that this kid loves dinosaurs, or I understand that the mom is the peacemaker, and I understand that this dad is old fashioned. And and so, ideally, if you can get character comedy out of them, it means that their characters are at least clear enough to understand. And and I think that just me and Jeff in particular just are are just no one makes us laugh harder than each other. I think to the detriment of every human who's ever been around us, where it's like these two chuckleheads over here, we're just like laughing with tears streaming down our face, like arms around our back, like, ah! <laughs> you know, the, the editor's just like rubbing his face slowly. Um, no, he's like, our editor was great, but but there was, um, there were all these moments just because I think we make each other laugh a lot. Um, and we were trying to sort of bring that the joy that we have from like making each other laugh like into the movie and hopefully some of that got in there but i think uh, that's the theory it's like if it makes us laugh hopefully it'll make an audience laugh uh, yeah, and that totally. was kind of the test I, yeah well I, I i sort of i figured out if it makes me like laugh till i'm crying <laughs> it makes an audience like laugh if it makes me <laughs> laugh it makes an audience chuckle if it makes me chuckle it's maybe get a smile out of them and if I just smile, then they're stone faced. Like, <laughs> what's next? Why did you decide to give the personal assistant a British accent? I will be perfectly honest here in just that the character was boring. <laughs> and we needed something. <laughs> Initially, it was me in the scratch, like, mm, hello, humans. I sounded like a He Man villain or something. Um, and, and we were just, well, you know, one, it's like, you know, we, we're trying to get sort of as diverse of a, you know, collection of people in the movie as possible. And two, just it, it felt like those, you know, that those, you know, Alexa and, and Siri and are always, yeah. are always women. And then, and then it, we wanted to add something extra to it to make it feel like to make, because the character is supposed to be really intelligent. Um, and I think good or bad. American people hear British accents and are like, that person sounds smart. <laughs> and then we had just sort of seen, um, we just sort of seen the favorite, which is so stunning. Um, and and Olivia Coleman was like both hilariously funny and also terrifying. Um, and I remember putting her voice to just, it was some scene from the favorite that the editors put together with a picture of Pal. And it was like, oh, Done, great. You know, we were, we were really struggling. Like at one point we we're thinking of Idris Elba for the phone just cause it was so like, hello. Um, but, um, but Olivia Coleman was just perfect. She really brought a lot of life to it. Um, yeah. That was not on the page. <laughs> the design thinking behind the robots. Can you tell me a, a little bit about that in terms of look and behavior? That was like the almost the first design and we kept trying a bunch of different stuff and none of it was as as sticky as that that first kind of look and it's like it narratively needed to uh both be able to be really frightening and really friendly and look like a high-end consumer product so it's like it could be i don't know there's just something about the the uh dumbness of it or the the simplicity of it that's just works with a face on it and also if it's just a blank black screen uh, and you light it right, is like haunting and uh, uh, lifeless. Yeah, it was it was really versatile, and and I, it, that was like the the only time I think us and the artists ever had a disagreement is like they just kept trying to do new designs, and they're like, "What about this design? What about this design?" And you could see them in the art of book, and they're like wonderful, but I was like, "It's gonna be the first one we did." <laughs> Um, just because there was something about it that worked in the, it, you could see it in the storyboards. It was like, oh, the robot is terrifying in this scene and hilarious in this scene. Like, I think this is, this is what we need. And, 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 you know, and, and the art, you know, cause like everything in the movie, we did a thousand versions of. So the artists are like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, eh. <laughs> 
Now, about the Fervy sequence, that seems to have really have captured people's imagination. Did you always know that it would be such a big hit? Weirdly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were always like, this is gold, you know, because uh, it always just made everyone in the crew laugh. I remember um, one, of, one of the artists that worked on the movie, Ryan Lang, is a really great guy and he's an amazing painter, but he's very quiet. Um, and I remember me and Jeff were reading to each other the first version of the Furby scene and we could hear him laughing hysterically in the next room. And I was like, I've never heard him laugh like that. Um, so, and it just made us die laughing. Like, uh, <laughs> that was like our favorite day on the movie. Anytime we were doing anything with the mall scene or like dark toys, we were just like, just keeled over crying with laughter. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, we liked it. Yeah, I thought that was going to be like the litmus test or something where it's like <laughs> audiences would either embrace it and love it as much as we did, or they that would be the moment where people are like, oh no, they just gave a couple of idiots a lot of money and time and let them make a movie. <laughs> like, this is not... Uh, and thankfully it was the former. Uh, <laughs> it worked out. That is the part of the movie where it really feels like you really handed the keys to a bunch of knuckleheads on this one, huh? <laughs> I have a question about the music. The Europeans here keep talking about how much they li like your evocation of the Dragon's Day at Dintei. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so it's just masterful the way you throw in Bach. So can you elaborate a little bit about your musical choices? First of all, we had so much help from Mark Mothersbaugh, who is like our musical, like I sort of walked around my hometown listening to Devo and listening to, you know, the Royal Tenenbaum soundtrack and the Rushmore soundtrack and stuff. So it's like, it was so wild to work with him and he's so inventive and, and, and like also, but his like melodies are incredibly warm and sweet. And, um, and he sort of like, you know, it was, it was a real, it was like a joy working with him, but but the, the, the licensed music, I mean, I think we just tried to sort of pick songs that we loved, <laughs> um, you know, because it's been really nice to see people, you know, these bands that aren't necessarily like huge bands, but people are like, there's two Los Campesino songs in this and I'm going to watch it start to end because of it. Because <laughs> you know, I do think if you, if you put, if you put like, oh, these are songs that we love, that'll be picked up by little antennas from people. And then another part of it was we just tried a zillion songs for every moment. Um, so it yeah. was like, you know, it was like, Jeff, you know, hey, hit me with 25 songs. I'll come up with 25 songs. The editor will come up with 25 songs, you know, and then we'll pick the one that works best. Um, so we, we, a lot of it was just trial and error. Well, I think it speaks to the overall philosophy too of just like love, like if we love it, it should stay. And if we yeah. don't, then we should beat it. Yeah, because sometimes there would be a song in the movie that someone would just suggest. And I was like, this technically works, but I hate this song, you know? And, <laughs> and then we would be like, is there something that works just as well that we actually like, you know, that we would want on a soundtrack that we would listen to, you know? So, um, so we would we would try to do that too, because it's like you know it, it, when you listen to a soundtrack of a Tarantino movie or like a Wes Anderson movie, it was like clearly there is someone who really likes this deep cut Bobby Womack song or whatever, um, and because yeah. of it, you discover it and you're excited and you're listening to it. And I think we try to think about it from the character too, where it's like, you know, like Alex Leahy and Grimes. And it's like, what would Katie listen to? And then what would Katie uh, listen to and dance to when she's like eight years old? And like, yeah. you know, what was on the radio and trying to come from this story-based place. Totally, yes, that is true too. I think a central message in the movie is this idea that art can save the world. And it's interesting that her father, that Rick at a certain point tells Katie um, that he didn't know art could be useful. Uh, <laughs> We're, uh, you know, at least I, I, you know, I won't lump Jeff into this, but, <laughs> yes or no, but it's like, I'm kind of a cornball and I, I do really think art can change the world. You know, I, I've seen it happen in my life, you know, where it's like, I watched the movie Beginners and I started calling my grandma because the movie's about a dying grandparent um, or a parent. I read this book, What is the What? And I started sort of, you know, 
uh, paying attention to what was going on in you know, Africa and stuff like that. So it's like, my life has been changed by art. And I was like, if my life is, can be changed by art, it's possible to change someone's life through art. So that was the goal <laughs> was to sort of <laughs> see if we can, you know, bring people together and, and, and sort of help families, you know, work out their problems and stuff through watching this movie, maybe you'd call your dad or something. And, and it's so wild because we've already gotten really, really nice, you know, letters and emails and stuff from people saying, my little brother, you know, texted my dad for the first time in months after watching this movie. I'm getting choked up saying it out loud. <laughs> um, and it's just, and it's, it's, it's so nice. It's like a great tool for teaching empathy and understanding other people and like really really good art kind of forces your brain to rewire its synapses and consider things from different perspectives and and angles and i think that voice in the conversation of society at large is essential yeah i almost thought that katie was the kind of alter ego of you guys in as much as She's a storyteller. She definitely yeah. has our like uh, uh, confidence that outweighs her actual <laughs> uh, uh, abilities. Um, but true. through perseverance and hard work and just uh, excitement and enthusiasm, like makes really fun stuff that hopefully people will like. The movie itself broadly is not that different from her movies. <laughs> um, you know, like um, it, it and I think me and Jeff both had that experience of, you know, we left home and went to art school and, and you know, it's, and not like it's this great tragedy or something, but it, you know, it is, it is something you have to work out with your family because that's not a normal path. Um, you know, and, and, and my dad was a lot like Rick where he's like, didn't understand, wasn't a dick about it, <laughs> but like, you know, but also, um, but also was worried about me, you know, worried that I would go hungry. That was like a relation, you know, sort of something we had to work out as people. He was used to dealing with me as sort of a child to lecture and, you know, sort of uh, teach nature lessons to. Um, and, and for the first time we were actually like talking like adults um, and it was a different relationship and we had to both grow uh, from it. Um, and that's sort of one of the places that the movie comes from. And I think Jeff is the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it was weird. Cause it's like my, my dad, like weirdly supported. He, like he really wanted me to be a musician. Like he loved the music and he was like, that's, that's what you should do. You should learn to play guitar. And, and, and it's like, it's weird to have a parent, like encourage you to do something that's probably not the most viable uh, uh, path towards <laughs> Uh, towards success and when I left to move to California to to uh, try to get into school to do this they're like yeah sure uh, I guess it could work out like don't don't call us for money but uh you know good good luck what was your favorite sequence uh in the movie one of mine is sort of Rick giving up the cabin um in act three always makes me cry um it's it's like really wonderfully storyboarded and animated and laid out and you know every department was really sort of firing on all cylinders and made that moment really sing to me and also the a new moment that sort of only got good at the very last minute was the scene right after where Rick is sort of watching this ridiculous video that Katie made but sort of realizing what he is sort of how he's maybe not seeing his daughter and then the other one is um just them you know, Rick and Katie just exploding robots together and, and, and all that. Cause it's so, it's the, the lighting team did such a beautiful job on it. And it's so joyous. Like I find myself grinning when I watch it <laughs> because I'm, I'm so happy. <laughs> what, Jeff, what about you? Probably the home movie scene in, in act one, when Rick is just like watching the videos of like him and young Katie. The first time we saw that in uh, uh, animatic, it was like Hannah Cho's boards, the editing, the song that we had to it at the time. Like it was so emotionally effective in a way that I had never uh, uh, felt affected by like an animated film before. Like it, I, I was just so like, oh man, like it's really, it felt really real and authentic. And the credit to that just goes to uh, Hannah's uh, uh, amazing boards. I was like, oh, we're, we're, we're doing it. We're, we're delivering on emotion. The plane is flying. Oh, okay. It's working. 
Um, but it still affects me uh, every time I watch it. And then even all the way through till the end, like I remember being on the mix stage and like Michael Semanic, our mixer was just like doing something with the music that just like made me start weeping in a way I never had before. And I was like, oh, you can still add value and emotion this far down the road. It's so many steps to get there. Yeah, I would love it one day, even though I'm super happy that it's on Netflix because so many people can see it, I would love one day for it to just be in theater so you could hear he did this crazy surround sound mix it's so beautiful it feels like you're in like a like a church or something how the moose says i love you that idea is so cute i mean do you think people will like be uh doing that in the cinema <laughs> or, like you know that you're start starting a new trend of saying i love you moose style i mean uh, whose idea was yeah to, to make this this language, the sound. We, we had that in the movie for a really long time. And I think the, and it was Jeff's idea to come up with the moose in general, um, which at first I was like, that's just like a normal animated movie. And then we're like, oh, it really w works. What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, let's just put it in. What do I, what, I was like, it's gotta be crazier. But I think um, the, the actual moose sound um, was something that we, it was me and Jeff and Chris Miller and Phil Lord in the editing bay. Um, and they were sort of like, I remember Phil was really like, this isn't specific enough yet because it was just sort of like Rick said something sweet to Katie and then it was over. So we just stood in front of a microphone and just, you know, just hit, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? You know, and, and eventually, I'm not sure who it was. It, it feels like a Phil idea or something to do the like, Arr! um, and then I was actually really skeptical of that moment for a long, like, I was like, I don't know, is this crazy? Is this too crazy? The moment I realized it was working was when the actors did it. Like they had so much fun doing it and they were like, oh, moose sound, what does the moose sound like? And we played it and they're like cracking up and trying to do it. Um, and when I saw how much like joy they were taking in it, I was like, oh, maybe this will work. Yeah, I think it was Phil. I think it was an edit bay Phil call. Like, why isn't this uh, uh, funny enough? Or why isn't this specific enough? It was just like bald sincerity originally. <laughs> One of Phil's great talents is like finding ways to make humor really uh, emotional and, and meaningful. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think, I think with, with Chris Miller and Phil in general, that's one of their superpowers. There can't be a single moment in this movie that's like stock that, that you've yeah. seen before in a movie, you know, like how can you make it inventive or observational on the other side of things to make, to make it stick? What makes the Mitchells versus the Machines particularly relevant to today's audiences? One thing that uh, we've noticed just looking online and seeing what people say, because it's so funny because because it's COVID and stuff, it's like you, you're you not in a theater with people. So you, you're sort of just like, you know, reading reading what people say on, on you know, online and stuff. And, and one of the things I think people have really responded to is that, especially right now, it feels like it's, it is really relevant because we've all just been through a disaster. <laughs> um, and, and I think that, I think that we've all realized how important these relationships are to our uh, relationships are when you can't visit your family, you start going nuts, you know, when you can't visit your friends and the people you love, you know, you're like, what, what am I even doing? And you start feeling crazy. Um, and I think that shockingly technology, we've seen the best and the worst of technology from in, in the pandemic where it's like, you've seen, oh, I'm just buried in my phone and I'm not talking to my wife, but also at the same time, this is, I'm able to contact my parents and have drinks with them and, and, and talk to them and, 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 and that sort of thing. You're just reminded of how important those relationships are. And that's sort of what the movie's about. Well, and I think people like really respond also to the specificity of the characters. Like one of my favorite like art quotes is this Victor Hugo quote that's like, uh, speak about your village and it'll be universal. And it's like, even if your family isn't exactly like the Mitchells or the details of knowing the Robertson head screwdrivers isn't who your dad is, like the <laughs> specificity that comes with that character and that worldview and, and all of the characters like feels at least like people that you know. And uh, uh, I think, 
uh, ends up being really relatable. Yeah, that, that's that's been really great. People, people sort of saying like, "Oh, I feel seen by you know Aaron or Katie yeah or, or something or you know my mom, um, Linda." Um, so it, so that 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 has been like super nice, and I I do think it's I do think that people just like to see themselves you know reflected on the on the screen and feel like they're less alone. Two very last quick questions. One is if there's anything you can tell me about what is next for both of you. I'm making a uh, Ninja Turtles movie, uh, animated uh, feature at Nickelodeon uh, with uh, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. It's gonna be amazing. Get it, ready, world. I will say it is really cool. All the stuff I've seen from it, I'm like, this is a, this is gonna be awesome, dude. Like he's, he's just really killing it. Um, uh, and then I'm I'm sort of going to take a long nap um, and rumble still skin style and wake up. No, Rip but I, I, I <laughs> Rip Van Winkle, yes. Um, or I'll turn straw into gold. Well, no, 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 no. Um, uh, but um, the straw of my tiredness, I will turn into. I'm going to maybe either make an animated movie or an animated series. But I'm I'm really excited about sort of um, pushing animation. You know, because I was really thrilled with how far we were able you know how much we're able to get away with in this movie in terms of like being experimental and i just kind of want to keep pushing that you know while making movies that are really connect with people um but also how can they be how can they sort of push the form more um and maybe be um not you know r-rated adult but like a, dealing with a little bit more of adult things me and mike were buddies on this last film but now we're rivals. <laughs> now, now we're, we do. We, we are planning both to be pushing each other. the boulder. <laughs> I have an well, elaborate booby trap set up in about thirteen seconds. <laughs> when his chair, when a giant piano falls on him, you'll know. <laughs> what advice or what words of wisdom would you have for young filmmakers out there who dream of becoming? directors and animators do it just just do it work work really hard pour yourself into it don't um don't spend years uh uh, <laughs> uh, uh falling into the artist trap of uh uh tying your self-worth to uh what you create just create for the joy of creation and uh the the world needs you and if you if you work hard if you put in the hours uh, it's a really wonderful thing to be a part of me and jeff we we got into this school cal you know cal arts that that all the pixar guys went to and and it's like a storied school but we both got rejected the first time we applied and i thought when i was a kid i was like oh if i get rejected from somewhere i'm going to turn into ash and blow away <laughs> um, and what i learned was like I got rejected, I didn't turn to Ash, and I was like, oh, I didn't get rejected, but I could see online who got accepted. I get why, they were better than me. Maybe I can work really hard for the next year and try to get as good as those guys and girls, you know, and, you know, work, 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 and then, and then through sort of determination and, you know, grit, you know, we both got in and, and we both suffered, I would say me and Jeff have suffered some really, catastrophic failures in the animation industry <laughs> um and but i've we had a lot of confused faces like yeah <laughs> <laughs> um you know and yeah. and you know through dint of just getting back up and running again you know every time we get knocked down i think i think has, has served us well and and that's something to remember for when you're a, a student is that it, it, it's gonna feel like the end of the world to not do well or to not succeed, but those failures are, are just lessons, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you learn from them and get stronger, you'll, you know, I feel like I sort of like hijacked the system when I realized like, oh, <laughs> failure is just a way of learning. It's like a video game. You just get, you know, you, you have infinite lives and you just, <laughs> I mean, not, for not everyone has infinite lives. I'm sort of, you know, a lucky in a lot of ways in my life um, that I've been able to sort of take those failures and learn from them and they weren't like debilitating. But but I do think that even little failures like, like oh, my drawing wasn't good or something can will only, if you let them, will only teach you how to be better. What's a Furby? 
Thank <laughs> you.